So let's talk about that first drink. High performing people have very busy brains. Raise your hand if you pretty much always remember having a really busy brain. Yeah, for our listeners, everyone's got their hands up. And so it makes sense that when you discovered alcohol, that it felt like a relief. Because the first part of the brain affected by alcohol is the prefrontal cortex. That's the smart part of our brain. It's also the overthinking part of our brain. So wasn't it a relief to have that first drink or two? Jennifer, will you read this slide for us? This is describing the, the early buzz. Yeah, the early buzz, dopamine. When you drink, the brain's reward system is flooded with dopamine, producing a euphoric buzz. In fact, dopamine production can increase with the first sip of alcohol, or even just by thinking about drinking, because your brain has probably associated pleasure with alcohol. Alcohol increases dopamine production, so you feel good and generally relaxed. In order to keep the good feelings going, your brain prompts you to continue drinking. Well, first of all, who thinks Jennifer has a voice for her own podcast? Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. See, that's the sweet spot. And that part of the drinking experience is what is how marketers make billions of dollars. Don't they? That's the part of the drinking experience where everyone wants to stay. <sighs> the exhale of the first, maybe second drink. That's the part where people will post on their stories on social media during the first or second drink. The overthinking part of your brain is turned down a little bit. And so you're not as worried about what people are thinking of how you look. Maybe it's easier to make small talk. Everyone relates to that, yeah? Definitely. Except it doesn't line up with the reality of alcohol. The reality of what this substance is designed to do, which is create a need for more and more consumption, more and more frequently. It is a highly addictive drug. Nobody's surprised by that when it comes to cocaine, right? If you hear about someone using cocaine and they're like, yeah, I started out doing a bump. You don't expect that five years down the road, they're just going to be doing a bump. They're probably going to be doing lines and be an addiction. But because of the marketing, because of the messaging around alcohol, when the drug does what the drug is designed to do, suddenly we are the problem. We have character defects. Hmm. And so, yeah, dopamine, it comes in, comes in fast, that early buzz. And then it starts to mess with the midbrain. 
I'll go back to the slide where I show you how it attacks the brain. So let's talk about this. And I know I'm skipping around a little. So first we've got the forebrain is affected, right? You're a little more relaxed. You're a little more chatty. And then it goes into the midbrain. Talking about the limbic system. People aren't posting pictures at this stage in the game. This is where things can get messy. This is where we may make some choices that we wish we didn't make. And I put on this slide, once this area of the brain is hijacked by alcohol, our behavior may not represent who we really are. Knowing through this program, through the, these, educate, these uh, coaching calls, which focus a lot on education, How has your perception of your past drinking issue changed a little bit with the understanding of the science? Jennifer? That it's not completely my fault. It's not my fault, but I have the power to regain my life back. Um, that's been the, the, and it gives me goosebumps just thinking about it because I love the science of it. It's, it's for everybody. I'm not alone here. It's everybody has this, this thought they can do it. Um, they just need to understand it more. And I feel like that, that this, this is just done so much for the benefit of understanding that I'm not alone, that Every, everybody goes through stuff like this and that it's the science behind it. And now I can combat it and knowing that, you know, most of it's a marketing ploy, but, but the science speaks for itself. And there, there are ways to rewire that brain. I, I never knew you could really rewire your brain and, and get to a better place. Mm -hmm. Would you, you talked about, you know, when you were drinking about the shame and, and, and you and I have talked about this, you know, some self-loathing and who the, who the hell am I? Who is this person? With this knowledge, what's shifted? How do you feel when you wake up and face the day now? I'm not as anxious. I... I know I'm going to make mistakes. I, I'm I'm not perfect. I, I used to feel like I have to be perfect. I'm always going, going, going. I'm always on. My brain never stops. But the anxiety, I never thought I had anxiety, but the anxiety, I wake up in the morning, my brain's not going a million miles a minute. I mm -hmm. take a deep breath. I'm grateful for so many things. And I sit back and I think, okay, today's going to be a good day. I'm really clear now I'm 20, 26 days in that didn't start for me. I mean, I had headaches, been doing this drinking thing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it didn't happen overnight. The first week or two, I was, I was half miserable. My headaches, I was tired. And this morning I'm on vacation. I got up at six 30 and I'm like, boom, I don't have that, that anxiety. Now is every day the same? No, but I, I can live better. I don't cope. I'm living my life. And I'm not put down and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not numbed anymore. I don't feel like I need that numbing. I'm living, I'm living a life now. I can, you know, I, I'm reclaiming that life where I'm not numbing myself all the time. I'm living in the moment. I'm not always like, what's going to happen? What's going on? What's going on? I'm, yes. I'm 
I'm evening, I'm finally evening out. I'm feeling so much better, but it's mm-hmm. taken the three weeks to get to this point and I can just see things going up. Amazing. Amazing. Yes, Steve. <laughs> um, regarding rewiring, I'd like your opinion on this. The pleasure reward cycle doesn't go away your sources of getting that pleasure is what changes not you're never going to lose that desire for pleasure and reward you never will you just seek it out in different ways Mm -hmm. so is that technically rewiring or uh or just I don't even know how to describe it. Um, uh, it. Just changing up of routine. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. And uh, oh, I'm pulling up a slide now. We're we're kind of hopping around, and I'm okay with it. What Jennifer's describing is a return to homeostasis. So we touched on the dopamine right? That sweet spot of drinking. Alcohol delivers 10 times the amount of dopamine that a normal pleasurable activity will produce. So look, we all knew how to have fun before we were dumping this drug into our body and brain. Over time, when we drink enough, enough times, the dopamine becomes dysregulated. And so you're right, Steve, we still have a reward pathway. It's just been hijacked. So when we first stop drinking, the stuff that used to be fun may not feel as fun. It's not easy. That's why we do it together. Overcoming, releasing alcohol is not meant to be done on your own. It's meant to be done with accountability, like Scott talked about, connection. Oh my gosh, I'm feeling this, me too. And then coaching, understanding the why. Everyone in this program is very intelligent. They're not just going to take what we tell them and say, oh, okay, I'll go do what Coach V tells me to do or Coach Sarah says is is the right thing. The why matters. And what I'm referencing today is a compilation of several studies from JAMA and the National Institute of Health, which I will share on another slide. So these aren't opinions. This is the science of addiction and the science of neuroplasticity. So yes, Steve, we're going to seek pleasure. Because what is life if we're not chasing some good times? The difference is we can receive pleasure in healthy, natural ways. The natural highs are real and they're coming your way. You may or may not experience them in the 90 days because just like getting over the flu, your body takes time to return to homeostasis. Great question. Is that helpful, Steve? Pardon? Was that, that helpful? helpful? Uh, incredibly so. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I get the replenishing, um, your ability to produce do- dopamine naturally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the cycle itself, the pleasure reward thing never goes away. It should go where you wouldn't be human anymore. <laughs> I don't want to live a life without some some reward pathways, right? How about you guys? <laughs> yeah. No, that was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. So when we look back at some of our follies from drinking, um, you know, unlike some of the more 
well-known paths to releasing alcohol. We don't spend a lot of time in the past. Um, and by the way, for our listeners, we are supportive of all paths to becoming alcohol-free. We have members who who engage, who attend AA, who go to Smart Recovery, whatever works. We we welcome all the tools. But one thing in our in our program that you won't find is a lot of uh, what is often known as a drunkalog, right? A drunkalog is uh, sharing all of your all of your stuff, all the dumb stuff you did when you were drinking. <laughs> we're not interested because here's the thing: through this education. Our goal is to help you understand that that person doing those things wasn't the real you. That's a human being under the influence of a highly addictive drug. And just like I referenced in that slide, We can look back at our drinking and say, oh, yeah, the good part, that was the, that was the forebrain. We can think about some poor choices we made when we were drinking and say, that was my midbrain under attack. And I never have to allow my brain to be attacked by this drug again. Like Jennifer said, it's not entirely our fault. This is a very socially expected drug. But with this awareness, it, it, it is our responsibility and you all took responsibility when you joined. But you get to return to the real you. You get to show the world the real you. Not a person who is under attack. Yes, Scott. So I, I just wanted to share that in a way that what you're talking about is maybe the scariest part of the whole program, right? Because the idea that there's a real me to be shown who's not the guy I know who's been drinking for you now 40 years um, mm -hmm. is sometimes maybe the most frightening part of the whole thing. I don't know who that person is. I don't, um, and so I can't imagine it. it. It's just the uncertainty of it, the unknown is something that makes me anxious, so. That's really honest and vulnerable. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying, okay, Coach V, that, that, that sounds lovely coming back to the real me, but to be honest, I don't really know who the real me is. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can anyone relate to that? Yeah, I get it, I do. When we drink maladaptively for years, we, we, we do start to believe that that version, that midbrain version of us is the real us. That reactive, irritable, stressed, anxious person, we can begin to believe that's our true identity. Well, and if behaviors, if you know, if you are the sum of your behaviors um, in your life, then that kind of is me, right? Mm -hmm. Can I throw something in, Victoria? Yes, Steve. Um, I spoke with a member of the group privately on cell phone. Um, and again, one of the cool things about this group is you make friendships and you can talk outside of this. And he said to me, um, 
he said he had pretty much conceded that this is just the way I am. I'm always going to be this way. Mm. And it wasn't until he joined this group that he thought his life couldn't be any different. So kudos to you and Jim and James, whatever. Mm. But it, it's it's fun talking to people outside the group mm. and get to know them better. Yeah. Uh, people and um but yeah people have that feeling of hopelessness like yeah. i can't do it it's never going to change just my, the way it is i see everyone nodding their heads and i'm nodding mine thank you so much for sharing that steve it's true sure. yeah yeah because we'd all tried before i tried so many times and I did have those moments of desperation, like, so this is it? Like, this is this is how it's going to go? So what if we start here? Scott and Jennifer and Brenda and Steve. And for our listeners, as, I, as we always mention, these are people who on the outside looked okay. You know, they knew internally that that it was time. They had to do something about this drinking thing. But they were, things were propped up all right. They might have been able to, to play the game a while longer, maybe, maybe. So, Scott, you asked a great question. I don't really know who I am. Everyone have a pen and paper? Okay. Let's take a couple of moments and... I invite you to step outside of yourself for a minute. If you were looking at someone who came into this program, who their lives were going all right, what do you think the decision to come into this program says about them? About their character, about their values? Because each of you made a choice to come in here. So what does that say about the kind of person you are? Scott, it looks like you finished. I did. Okay. Since, uh, since we're being vulnerable here, do you care to share a bit about what you wrote? Sure. So I used your thought experiment, what I might think of someone who joined this program, which means an impression I have of the people I've met and uh, my own thoughts. So I think a person who joined this program has reached a point of intense unhappiness around alcohol. That person has taken personal responsibility to make a change. That person is willing to face a challenge. That person cares about his or her impact on those in their life. And that person cares about their health and quality of life. All pretty positive. So is that person you, Scott? Yes. <laughs> yes. How's it feel? That's nice. A little... Um, warmth rising up through my chest and my face. So thank you for saying that. Wow. Kind of a breakthrough moment. The start. Mm. Mm -hmm. Brenda, do you care to share yours? Yes. Um, I, I see a person that as many times as I've tried and failed to quit drinking, I'm, I'm not a person that gives up. When I was working full-time, I never gave up. If someone expected something of me, I kept going. And with this program, I'm going to keep going. Um, it, it's I feel like I have accountability by being here. Um, uh, I used to suit up, show up, and be very inconsistent. And fuzzy and I can now do all of that and be alert and awake and have clarity in what I see so I I really feel that um, being accountable um, 
is has made me just dedicated to this program. Um, and that's the kind of person I am. Yes. So what I'm hearing is outside of your relationship with alcohol, you were, you're a person who was tenacious and dedicated and had grit and commitment and follow through. Yes. Except for when it came to alcohol. Yes. And now with what you're learning, with the community, with the connection, the accountability, the education, it sounds like, tell me if I'm getting this right, that you're able to take all of those qualities which served you in the other areas of life and finally align them in your journey to release alcohol. It's so refreshing um, because it's still there and I still have a long way to go. It's going to take a while, but I can I can physically and mentally feel them coming back. And that creates enough excitement in me to just want to be here. Yes. And um, I want to enjoy my life. I, I There's such a stigma with alcoholism and I never enjoyed that. And that would keep me from being vulnerable mm -hmm. because I always had to hide it and make everything look like it was okay. Um, I don't have to do that anymore. Sometimes everything isn't okay. Yeah. But I'll get through it without alcohol. Without alcohol. Yes. Enough of alcohol telling us what we're capable of handling. Exactly. Right? Yes. Oh, Bren, yeah, Brenda, I know in other areas you're you're committed and dedicated and productive and all that, but come on, girl, you know it's too much. You need me. You need oh. me to get through life, Brenda. I mean, imagine having a friend like that, guys. You tell that friend to go blow. <laughs> That's off, buddy. You don't get to tell me what I can do, how capable I am. But we let alcohol do that. Bananas. I totally let alcohol do that. I would, um, I became... From being an extrovert, I truly became an introvert mm -hmm. because of alcohol. I isolated and I lost my, I lost my whole self. Mm -hmm. You started to believe the lies that alcohol told you about you. I did. I did. And I didn't know if there was a way out for a while, but like I said, I, I don't give up. <laughs> No, you don't. No, you don't. I'm I'm glad. I'm glad you didn't give up. I get to meet you. We all get to meet you. And gosh, you've got so much great living ahead of you now. I do. And I'm going to I'm going to do it. I'm going to experience it. I know you are. <laughs> Jennifer, thanks for waiting. Yeah, I was just gonna say we've been talking about beliefs and all these beliefs and and I didn't know who I was. I knew who I was becoming. And a lot of those beliefs, I'm I'm talking about the, the I was going to say, you know, coming into the program, somebody that's going to choose. My, my adjectives were strong and smart, dedicated people ready to make a real change and that there's something better out there to be healthier and to be courageous for taking that leap of faith to be the person that you really are. And my belief system throughout this whole journey of alcohol has led me to, I, I mean, I'm looking at these words. These aren't me. I'm not, I'm not strong. I, I'm dedicated, but I'm not strong. I'm not courageous. I'm, I'm scared of everything. But coming into this has opened my eyes with the, you know, why, why, why in my belief system and me talking to these people or who are maybe becoming, wanting to be part of this program is, you know, strong, smart, courageous, dedicated. These are all, these, these are who I used to be and who I'm becoming again. I'm finding, again, it gives me goosebumps because I'm finding out who I really am without this poison in my body. And it, it feels good knowing that I'm finally taking control of my life and it's exciting. So I just wanted to 
talk about, we've been talking about beliefs and I'm writing these words thinking, I don't, I don't believe these to be true, but they are, they really are. They absolutely are. I wrote some in the chat and uh, just some of the things that I've heard from you guys and I encourage you to add to it in the chat. So I've got strong, smart, dedicated, accountable, personal responsibility, personally responsible, tenacious, courageous. Throw some more in there, guys. Are you talking about reasons for joining the program? Oh, no, just the the statements about, you know, the type of people that make oh, this choice. I get you. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. In this, pro I mean, <laughs> I'm, Jennifer, I'm like pretending I'm a listener tuning in for the first time. And, and I think I would double check the title of the podcast and think, these people are not, there's no way they're actually talking about being alcohol free and sounding this dang excited. <laughs> yeah, I've met some of the best people in this group, some of very intelligent, uh, very successful people. Mm -hmm. And to James' credit, if he was the one that set this up, mm -hmm. it's a great concept because. And it sounds somewhat snobbish, but you share a lot more in common um, than if you go to a generic meeting somewhere where you get people that just got out of jail or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And so, but despite having successes in our life, we've all sucked at this mm -hmm. previously. Mm -hmm. And so we all share that in common too. 